Welcome to this farewell prayer for the Reverend Dr. Ula Fixet Veit, the outgoing General Secretary of the World Council of Churches. Sisters and brothers, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You are welcome to this farewell prayer for the Reverend Tveit, the outgoing General Secretary of the World Council. Churches, we are gathered to thank God for the gift of leadership provided by Reverend Tweet to the WCC during the last 10 years. This is also a moment for us to express our gratitude to the Reverend Tweet for his faithfulness, commitment, and service to the ecumenical movement and in particular to the WCC. Ours is to thank God and pray for the Reverend Tweet and his family as he relocates back home to take on a new role in the Church of Norway. Finally, we gather to pray over the current global health crisis caused by COVID-19 that is impacting churches and communities in an unprecedented way. We would have loved to meet physically but due to this, it has not been possible. New online opportunities to gather and communicate have opened up, for which we thank God, especially those in communication. In the spirit of pilgrimage, feel welcomed and allow the Holy Spirit to guide and inspire us during this time together. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praises will continually be in our mouths. God, you are rich in mercy unto all that call upon you and have never left yourself without the witness of dedicated lives. We give you thanks for all your servants who, having heard your call, devoted their lives and gifts to the service of your kingdom. Today, we pause especially to give thanks for, to you for the ministry and leadership that your servant, Reverend Olaf Fixetveit, has given to the World Council of Churches over the past decade. As we do so, we also give thanks for all who serve this and other ecumenical bodies in the name of Christ. Make us glad, O oh Lord, to be numbered with those who serve you in the fellowship of your Son, and grant that we may have part with them in bringing to fulfillment your purpose of love for the whole world. And as we come with thanksgiving, we also, with humility, acknowledge that in ourselves, there is neither power nor wisdom sufficient for the work you give us to do. But our hope rests in you, in whom all wisdom and strength are found. O oh Lord, on this day and on, in this hour, receive and sanctify us by your grace that all we do is in your name may be acceptable in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. At this moment, Seth and I will be reading our responsive from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Our Gospel reading is from St. John, chapter 10, verses 11 to 17. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I laid on my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear colleagues, dear sisters and brothers, the Good Shepherd. Among the many images of God we have from the Bible, this is the one that is particularly dear to many. And Psalm 23 uses the strong and very realistic words, and therefore also comforting words. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff comfort me. It is sometimes challenging to believe this. Like in the times of the pandemic that humanity is facing today. In this time is though the time to hold this image up for one another in a way that we haven't done before. And also to remind ourselves that this is the God we believe in. But what is actually a shepherd doing? On my many walks in the Jura Mountains, looking at Geneva and Bosi from a distance and from above. I've often passed a huge flock of sheep. There were always dogs protecting the flock, not attacking us, but just telling us with their barks, keep a distance. Then I've been looking for the shepherd who usually used to be there. Sometimes it took a while to discover him. Often he has been sitting on a distance at a strategic point in the landscape, apparently relaxed, but very observant, observing the flock and us hikers. He let the sheep go around in a wide area as if they were by themselves, free to do what they were there to do, to eat, 
to digest, to be. And they apparently knew that he was there. They knew him and he knew them. And their relationship made them trust in his presence, even if they did not see him all the time. Another image of a shepherd in my mind is one from Bethlehem. I see an elderly man trying to run after a small flock of sheep, guiding them in the streets to find another spot that is still green. The shepherd's field around Bethlehem have been reduced drastically due to the ongoing occupation of their land. The shepherd still tried to find somewhere to go with them, to go with them in a hurry, protecting them from cars and other risks. These are the two examples that I have seen that helps really me to illuminate this image of the good shepherd. But I could mention many others, not only those who deal with animals, but the many who see, who care, who accompany, who walk or even run with those at risk. And many, many of them I know are doing this. A woman, even if the two examples I mentioned were men. Well, in times like these, so much is challenged. Our space is shrinking in many ways. The normal way of organizing our lives and work is not here and there. We cannot even say goodbye in a normal way. And fears and anxiety come to our minds. Fear for our dear ones, but also for ourselves. For our colleagues, for friends, for families, for congregations, for the people to whom we belong and are far away from us and for the people we have got to know through our work and our travels in the WCC. We know that many of them are very vulnerable to this pandemic and to the virus, and particularly also to the many negative effects of the pandemic that might result in a dysfunctional society, less access to work and food, sanitation, clean water and health services. We start to understand what kind of threats many are facing as individuals, as communities, as all as one humanity. But this is our time. We cannot choose another time. And when the World Council of Churches was established, they came out of a catastrophe caused by some who wanted to be the rulers of the world, the Lord at that time. It led to a world war to genocide, to enormous sufferings and disasters. And then they who got together in 1948 formulated that the basis of the WCC is our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And this is still our basis. And you might have recalled that I often have said as General Secretary, let's go back to basics, to be able to live now and to go into the future with hope. And I believe this is the time to see that the Lord and Savior carries also the image of the Good Shepherd. This is our time to hold up this image of the God who sees us. This is the time to remember that Jesus, the Good Shepherd, has experienced everything about being human, even being forsaken and abandoned by others and to the extreme of suffering and death, even thinking that he was forsaken by God. The crucified God sees us. And this is the time to hold up the image of God who has risen from the death, the God of life who sees us. And the, God, the good shepherd is not only seeing us, but walking and even running on our side when he have to do so. So, how can we hold up this image of God to others and to one another? How to believe that God cares for all? Well, I think it is as simple as it is difficult. It is by just doing it. Not by telling ourselves and everybody how strong we are in our faith, pretending we have no worries or doubt about this or that. We have. And therefore, we just 
have to lift up this image. Just do it. Repeating it to others and to ourselves. Reminding one another who the Good Shepherd is. Reading the texts of the Bible and of our faith traditions. Singing the songs of faith. Sharing our images of faith. Saying our prayers. Even sometimes crying. As we pray to the Good Shepherd. Do not forsake us. And then doing it through our work for the WCC, in our programs, in our support functions, and in leadership roles, just trying to show that we also care. We do this and that because we believe there is a good shepherd who cares, and particularly when the times are difficult. The WCC was born in crises and it was established to continue to address crises. It was born out of a distance and a division among the churches, out of the disasters of the world wars of the 20th century. It was there to end colonialism and to combat racism, to work for the end of the Cold War and the threat of nuclear annihilation, to prevent and end armed conflicts, to stop the abuse and the destruction of God's creation, to address climate changes, to combat globalization when it makes the few rich and the many poor, to fight poverty, to stop violence in the name of religion, to advocate for the rights of refugees, to oppose destructive nationalism, to address illness and endemics, stigmatization and exclusion like of HIV AIDS, to end the gender-based violence, to end violence against children, and the list is very long. And we know this is our time. And just now, it is also the time to address the pandemic crisis. Therefore, there is a constant need for an ecumenical movement that is a movement of love and care. One of my strongest wishes and visions when I started my work as a general secretary was that we could be able to be a mutually accountable fellowship to one another not talking or acting as if the others were not here with us. One of my objectives was that we could recognize and acknowledge the significance of what the others contribute. Indeed, first of all, it is about seeing one another as human beings, and then about seeing one another as followers of Christ, and to receive the contributions of the other churches and partners in this fellowship of sharing. And within the WCC as an organization, it is about seeing the other streams and departments, what each one of us is contributing to the whole. And therefore, this mutual accountability of working together means that we work together in transparency, in mutual trust, affirming our common basis and purpose in very practical ways. It's therefore also about making ourselves visible, seen to one another and to respond by seeing and recognizing, moving together in our landscape, in our time. The images of the Good Shepherd have inspired me, but also challenged me a lot as General Secretary of the WCC. Am I, are we, able to show this image of God in what we do? I've tried to exercise these models of leadership, to be observant, to see, to lead to the right places, to take the right moves at the right time. And in doing so, I've tried to see and acknowledge the gifts and opportunities of each of you, to find the best way to walk and to work together, and sometimes to run together when something was urgent. Quite often, it was. Today, I want to remind us what we often say and what we often emphasize. We are as human beings created in the image of God. This gives all of us our value and dignity. However, this means also that we are as human beings carrying an image of God to one another in this world. It means that we are called out like kind to be the watch and the guardian of our sister and brother. We are called to be an image of the Good Shepherd, 
of the Good Shepherd ourselves, to be among those who cares to respect and protect the others for who they are and what they are. So let us hold up this image of God together, the God of life, the Good Shepherd, who is with us on our pilgrimage of justice and peace, also in such times as these. And this is, I believe, what the ecumenical movement should be. This is also why it's time for the WCC to say now, Christ's love moves the world to reconciliation and unity. Not because we are perfect and successful in everything, but because we do this together. In the name of the Good Shepherd. Amen. Loving God, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to spread, we pray for those who have no home, no land, no food, no work, no medicine, and no peace. May we recognize and serve Christ, the Good Shepherd, in the suffering and the needy. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We thank you for all your gifts to creation. As the world grapples with this pandemic and experience physical distancing, economic downturns, and an ongoing health crisis, teach us to share with others our time, our energy, our resources, and our love. Make us sensitive and responsive to the wounds in the world, in the human family and creation. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Almighty God, through the work of the Holy Spirit, you have called us into the fellowship of your glorious church. As your people in all our offices where we serve, May we fulfill the duties you have given to us and enjoy the privileges of our spiritual home. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Gracious God, pour out your heavenly grace upon these who offer themselves for your service. Bestow upon your people the fullness of your grace so that we may serve all humanity while witnessing to the power of Christ's love. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Faithful God, we pray for your blessings and your help for the ministry and the work of the World Council of Churches. Continue to uphold your servant, Reverend Dr. Olaf Dix today, as he continues his ministry as the presiding bishop of the Church of Norway. We pray too that your divine presence will guide your servant, Father Johan Sauka, as he leads the WCC in a new capacity, endow and empower him and all who serve in leadership in various capacities with wisdom and courage in this season. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Eternal God, be present in all the works of your universal church, which are undertaken according to your will. Grant to all who labor in the name of Christ a pure intention, patient faith, sufficient success upon earth, 
and the bliss of serving you in heaven through Christ our Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Please join me in saying together our, the Lord's Prayer in our own languages while I say it in Romanian. Tatăl nostru care ești în ceruri, sfințească-se numele Tău. Vie împărăția Ta, facă-se voia Ta, precum în cer, așa și pe pământ. Pâinea noastră cea spre ființă de nou nouă astăzi. Și ne iartă nouă greșelile noastre, precum și noi iertăm greșiților noștri. Și nu ne duce pe noi în ispită, ci ne izbăvește de cel rău. Ca Ta este împărăția și puterea și slava a Tatălui și a Fiului și a Sfântului Duh, acum și pururea și în vecii vecilor. Amin. Be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. It is now time for me on behalf of the leadership of WCC and Wolfgang and uh, staff to offer a few words of gratitude. And as I do that, I'm also aware that you, Reverend Dr. Ola Fixet Veit, are still part of us and a member of the ecumenical movement, and particularly the family of the World Council of Churches. Connecting at the initial point and departing or parting is always a very emotional experience. And I'm aware that as I offer these words, my mind races around our journey together in these last 10 years, as we have sought to serve the Lord. These are very few preliminary remarks, and I hope and pray that God will grant us another opportunity for us in the ecumenical family to express our deep felt gratitude. May I start by saying that when you came in, Perhaps there were reservations by some quarters, but you knew the council very well because you had worked on a major part of the life of the council, and that is faith and order in your own studies. And I want to believe that because of that, one of the things that you have helped us to really reinforce is strengthening ecumenical cooperation and interest in ecumenism. Vast journeys that were made by you, colleagues, and the leadership to the churches and to all the continents during these last 10 years have actually proved your commitment to broadening strengthening and ensuring that those who have been in the movement continue, those who had slackened, revive, and new ones come on board. And for this, we know that it costed you, you traveled extensively, but we thank God that you are a healthy person and God gave you that grace. Besides visiting member churches, we saw another renewed engagement with the national councils and the regional ecumenical organizations, and particularly those in the area where conflicts seemed to persist and which had created major challenges to the life of the church. I can mention a couple, particularly from Africa, South Sudan, Sudan, Burundi, 
Asia, we can also mention your commitment to the peace in Korean Peninsula. And so this for me is something that we cherish and we hope to move forward. The other area of an deepening and strengthening cooperation was the whole relationship of the World Council of Churches with the Vatican. And we have seen over the years, and particularly towards the end of your leadership, closer cooperation, which even meant that we could celebrate our, our 70 years with the presence of Pope Francis. That is a landmark. And at programmatic level, we have seen our staff engage with the various departments in Rome. The other area that I'd like to lift up in your leadership has been the way in which you have exercised the following aspects. You've been very consultative, making sure that your staff and particularly the leadership of the council before you take decisions is well informed, is well prepared, and in that way facilitated a number of decisions. The second aspect has been the efforts you've made to be as inclusive, and that again has contributed to the atmosphere, particularly in the governing bodies, of listening to one another, of seeking to fellowship and to take stands together. You have also been a very good listener. And in being a very good listener, you have made it possible to turn situations that were sometimes controversial into finding solutions. So rather than looking at problems, you have provided ways towards leadership. You've been as a good Viking from Norway, very persistent uh, on matters of truth and of our faith. Uh, the other one has been your humility. You've not shown us that you are the boss, you are on top, but you've been humble enough and you've also been very courageous. And on this issue of courage, may I lift up your role in seeking ways to actually address the pension crisis when you came in, which now has resulted in the Green Village. Uh, and we pray that that vision will continue to bear fruit and that those who come after you will remember the courage, the sacrifice, and the determination to work towards sustainability of the World Council of Churches. Three things stand out for me as we part for the next phase of our engagement. One is that the pilgrimage of justice and peace has been an issue that has really raised our profile as a World Council of Churches, both within the fellowship, with the other faiths, and with uh, <laughs> Through this pilgrimage of justice and peace, which is your mark, you've also helped remind us as believers that we are people of the way. And these people of the way becomes even much more pertinent during this crisis because that then says to us, we are not stagnant, we are moving, but we are focused in our move. We need to look at others, lift them as our prayers have 
so rightly pointed. It is also a mark of your faith in Jesus Christ and a mark of your leadership. The second aspect of your ministry during these last 10 years and which echoed back my own work with other Christians is the focus on the cross. In your initial years, you lifted up the theology of the cross. And the cross for me is not just a symbol. The cross represents that symbol that gives me the identity as a Christian, that reminds me of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ shed on Calvary for the sake of the unity of humankind and unity of Christians. So the cross came very strongly up to me and I'm sure to others as well as that anchor in our faith. And I want to lift this as you leave us that the cross remains central in our ongoing journey. And as we move into the future, may we remember the sacrifice that God made for us as humanity, the new covenant that gives us a new identity, a new fellowship, a new family, and therefore a new community. The third one was when you came in, you talked very much about the well-being of the council in terms of staff, the health of the staff. And even if you did not achieve much, but that remains a fundamental issue for staff health, staff relationships. And I think you did try in many ways. And so I want again to say that this notion of well-being to which uh, the Archbishop Emeritus, Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, has spoken a lot on it, is very central at this particular time when the pandemic is raging. So how do we, as WCC, carry forward that concept, that experience, that very strong issue of well-being of God's people, well-being of God's creation. So thank you so much. It was for me a privilege to have been on the panel that interviewed you among others. And I want to thank the Central Committee that appointed you because it was the spirit of the Lord. Uh, it is important for us to now indicate that yes, you leave us, but we know that you are still with us and as the leader of the Norwegian church, the Church of Norway is an important part of the World Council of Churches and we've seen that happen during your tenure where they have engaged in different ways and we want to believe that as you go back, we will even engage more and not only engage more, but that for me again, this is another experience that I thank God for and I thank you for, that you take back to your church, to your country, the experiences you have received, the networks that you have, so that together we continue proclaiming the gospel of good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Ula, thank you for your dedication, for your concern, for your commitment and for your leadership to the ecumenical movement. And for such a time, we want to thank God for the gift he gave us through you and pray that as you journey on, these qualities that you have exhibited in the council will even grow larger as we seek to enrich and 
and uh, enrich life and enrich our fellowship and nourish and nurture one another, particularly in these very hard times. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the leadership and the staff, may the almighty God grant you the strength, the wisdom to continue to serve in his vineyard with others. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you. Then we are able to listen to nine more voices from the staff community. And Bishop Mariani is also able to join us now. We will open up with a few slides with pictures and with quotes from uh, Reverend Dr. Olaf Fixetwite and his life and work with the council the last 10 years. A visionary missionary. The theme of the pilgrimage of justice and peace forces us to lift our eyes to believe that we belong to a movement that is searching for what is better. The truth of the gospel can only be sought in a sense of accountability to what is given to us as the faith through the ages. We are seeking the signs of the kingdom of God in this world and particularly also seeking to manifest these signs ourselves. This foremost biblical commandment to love continues to be the very foundation for Christian engagement in key issues of poverty, inequality and climate change. As Christians, we seek peace and we educate our people to seek peace. We have the responsibility to carry on the work of transformation and put into practice what has already been affirmed and envisioned. We stand for an alternative way, the way of inclusive love. Brothers and sisters, that simple greeting sets us all together in the light of God and proclaims us to a beautiful and radical truth. These challenges require leadership accountable to the whole and one humanity for the sake of justice and peace for all. We are called to find the proper expression of the love given in Christ to us in our way of living together. We serve the God of life, leading us to justice and peace. Love is always about relationships and love is about the future. Where are we going from here? The church ought to be seen and heard. The prophetic role of the church is a matter of being a clear voice and of being both critical and constructive. Bishop Olaf Fixetweit, Church of Norway, consecration in the Cathedral of Nidaros, 10 May 2020. Thank you. Then I invite Diana Shablos to be the first speaker. Diana Shablos, the assistant to the general secretary. Yes, hello everyone. Olaf, it has been such a great honor and joy to work with you these past 10 years. Though I have to admit that way back in 2009, when you were elected as general secretary, I was scared. You were not a familiar face. You were not a former colleague. You came from outside. I hardly knew you, and I thought you were cold and distant, as unfortunately we tend to stereotype the Scandinavian. But this took me completely wrong. Little by little, we discovered that not only you were not cold and distant, but that you had a warm personality and a wonderful sense of humor. One anecdote was when after a staff party, some of my colleagues, some of my friends, stopped in my office and we had a drink together. We walked in, you said hello, and then you walked into your office. The following day, you said you had something to tell me. Oh, I was so nervous. I thought you were going to say that was not a behavior to have in the general secretariat. But no, you said, it is so nice to know that the general secretariat is a place where colleagues 
feel welcome and comfortable dropping by and, the, and continuing the party. Please continue this way. Olaf, you have always been available to colleagues and visitors. You have heard them. You have provided pastoral care. Many times, people walked into your office looking miserable, and when they came out, they were smiling and feeling so much better. You have also accompanied us during these sad moments when we lost some dear colleagues and friends. And most precious, you have over and over thanked us, your colleagues, and recognized the work we were doing. I am so grateful for the many things you did for the council, which Dr. Agnes has already mentioned. But most meaningful for me, and just and probably the highlight of my 35 years in the WCC, was the historic visit of Pope Francis. This one of your numerous achievements as General Secretary. Olaf, I wish you well in this next phase of your life. I am so happy that we will be back in your country next to your lovely wife, Anna, your children, and your grandchildren. I end up by inviting you to visit me in Chile, along with Anna, of course, or in Spain, where we will probably retire. And if you visit me in Chile, I will take you wine tasting the way we did in Roll when you first started work. Hola, goodbye, hasta luego, au revoir, barbel. We stay in touch, but stay at home. And this I mean for everyone. Thank you. Then I would like to invite the dog Kjall, IMD manager, to enter the floor. Hello, Ola. Hello, colleagues. Um, there are many things to say and many memories to share, but only three minutes to speak. Olaf, we've done a lot of things together over the last 10 years, including the Busan Assembly, no small event. What I have appreciated most about your leadership is your passion for the unity of the church. The common understanding and vision of the WCC speaks of deepening and broadening the fellowship, deepening the relationship among member churches, and broadening our cooperation with churches that are not members of the WCC. I'm particularly thankful for your leadership in broadening the fellowship, your efforts to bring more churches into membership, and to strengthen cooperation with churches that are not members of the WCC have been remarkable. Perhaps the most visible example as has already been mentioned, was the visit of Pope Francis to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the WCC. But I think the most historic achievement has been in, to encourage the leaders of the Pentecostal movement to affirm that we need one another if we are to truly be faithful in Christ. Promoting unity in Christ often requires overcoming the divisions of the past. The divisions between East and West took place 1,000 years ago. The divisions between Catholics and Protestants took place 500 years ago. We inherited these divisions from history. The division between Pentecostals and the ecumenical movement occurred in the last century, and our generation shares a special responsibility for healing this division. I remember attending the Pentecostal World Congress with you in, 20, in 2010 in Stockholm. It was the first time in over 60 years of mutual existence that the World Council of Churches and the Pentecostal World Fellowship offered the world a sign of mutual recognition in Christ. That moment was a watershed that has continued to strengthen the work of the Global Christian Forum and the WCC's relationship with the Pentecostal World Fellowship the division is slowly being healed. This is a lasting gift for the unity of the church for which Christ prayed. Thank you. Can I invite Joy Eva, Bohol Program Executive for Youth? Hi, Allah. I guess, um, thank you so much uh, for the invitation also to be able to give, so, share some words of gratitude 
um, during this time that I had an experience of working with you and also with the colleagues at WCC. In my relatively short time being with WCC, I would say that under your leadership, um, youth engagement has been more visible in the different programs, uh, programmatic areas and departments of the World Council of Churches. So thank you so much for your support in making sure that there is a creative way that we could work together and collaborate together among different colleagues and different areas in the World Council of Churches. And I think because of this collaboration and the support under your leadership, we are able to provide also more opportunities and programs for young people in the ecumenical movement. And that is, I would say that is a big step um, in really becoming or living out our intention, our vision of engaging more young people in the movement, not only within our fellowship, but even with our ecumenical partners as well. And I've seen that uh, during my two and a half years so far here at the World Council of Churches. I would also say that um, because of the commitment under your leadership to have a full-time um, staff to work on youth engagement, that's why this position was offered. And um, it has also opened opportunity to, for the World Council of Churches to show, um, and this is also a reflection of the World Council of Churches, uh, during your term that indeed we are um, we are we are true to our words of um, saying that young people have a space in our um, in our table and so that uh, those things and um, I also appreciate on behalf of the ECHOS Commission um, that uh, you ensure the implementation of their recommendations um, from the young people, uh, not only from the ECHOS Commission, but also from the young people who created, who have written call to actions um, for or advice to the World Council of Churches on how we could better engage young people. And you have also, um, uh, you have also supported the uh, making sure that young people are consulted in the different um, areas of our work with ecumenical partners in webinars and even um, different workshops that we hold. So this is a very visible, um, visible step really that I would say has improved a lot. And especially as we move forward towards the assembly, I uh, have seen a great support to always involve young people in different spaces. And this happened during your leadership. And so I appreciate that. And um, a lot of young people are also benefiting um, to be included in different spaces. And so I pray that um, as we also move forward, as the World Council Churches, colleagues, the fellowship move forward, we continue this kind of inclusion and um, intention of including young people in our spaces um even you know in the different uh in the different areas we work in uh, not only until assembly but even moving forward and i also uh, believe that as you transition to your new position in uh, in norway you would also continue to support um, and, and strengthen and ensure young people's voices and space in the church of norway so god bless and thank you for your leadership thank you Joanna. thank you then I welcome Mark Johnson, Finance Manager. It is an honor to have the opportunity to bring my voice into this special event, to recognize the contributions of Olav as General Secretary and to share appreciation and thanks. Our contact has been regular, sometimes from a little distance, but also close on some important occasions. But how should I start? Well, it struck me that one word springs to mind, and that is courage. Why courage? Well, it takes courage to lead, to be decisive when it matters, and to change tack when the weather conditions turn out other than expected. Winston Churchill said, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. I've taken a halfway point and I'm sitting down to speak. He also said, courage is rightly esteemed the first of human qualities because it is the quality which guarantees all others. So has Olaf been courageous? Well, yes. 
to take on the role of General Secretary in the first place, and then to get to grips with the task of finding out what it really meant. At the start, he did not imagine that finance would be one focus of his attention, but it soon turned out to be the case. The 2008 financial crisis, crisis had happened before Olav took up his role, and he must have felt something like, what have I done to deserve this? When the state of the pension fund became clear to him. Did he run away? Did he isolate himself to study the minutes of pension fund board meetings of the past? Well, neither. But he did make sure he understood the issues and gave them thought. He looked forward. Did he lead the council to the right solution by listening and thinking to reach the right conclusions? I would say yes, I believe so. Today, we begin to see the fruits of the choices made, even though the story is not yet over. In 2015, the Swiss National Bank pulled the plug on supporting the Euro and it went down the drain. This meant less Swiss francs for the council and more late evenings for the bean counters. Olav did not despair, but took us on a strategy that led to a revised budget. It is the only time that I have known two budgets to be issued in the same year, but how necessary it was in this case. Contributions income of the council was 27 million Swiss francs in 2009 and 18 million in 2019, one third less. When recalling the times of challenging budgets, my memory often turns to Olav's regular encouragement that goes something like, don't focus on what you don't have. Think about what you can do with what there is. Or, as you wander on through life, whatever be your goal, keep your eye upon the donut and not upon the whole. So much can be achieved with 18 million Swiss francs spent wisely. Olaf's choice to make his home at Bossy was a visible sign of his commitment to the life of the Ecumenical Institute and also proved to be a good place to hold aperitifs during executive committees. His move shows his attachment to the council and what it stands for, a commitment that communicates readily to others. The last 10 years have certainly been challenging for the General Secretary, but I can say that more often than not, he has treated difficulties as opportunities, listened and reflected with discernment before coming to conclusions, showed determination, changed course when the one chosen has proved not to be the best, dealt with stressful situations without passing his stress on to others and has had the courage to listen to the finance staff, which I know can be quite a challenge in itself. Above all, Olaf has earned my respect, and I dare say yours as well. I give thanks for his time with us and wish him well for the next stages of his life. He might well say, well, it wasn't anything really. Water's nothing to an engine with determination. A quotation taken from Thomas the Tank Engine, authored by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey, writing books for children. I know I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues in the finance and IT and facility services teams when I say thank you. Thank you, dear Olaf. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Then we will invite Peter Pro, the CCA director. Well, Olaf. Uh, hello to you and hello to all the colleagues here online. Um, it's been a long time that I've had the privilege of working with you, not only during this 10 year period of your leadership in the World Council of Churches, but also for the much longer period before that in my previous role with the Lutheran World Federation and your previous role with the Church of Norway. And there are many points in that long timeline that I could recall now some shared experiences, and probably some things I shouldn't recall, at least not in this context. But I do want to pick up, um, well, I do want to mention that during that entire period, I've been struck repeatedly by a very important 
uh, set of combined capacities and skills that you have. Obviously, a very strong set of skills in the fields of, of theology uh, uh, and, and a, a very deep spiritual sensibility. But combined with, I think, a, a really quite finely tuned strategic political sense. And I've seen that uh, applied in a number of different contexts. But just one emblematic story that I, I want to recall here, probably some colleagues will have heard it already. But I'm reminded repeatedly of the occasion when we were preparing for our trip to North Korea together. And uh, in the course of that preparation, we had to determine what sort of gift we would take for Kim Jong Un. And you made a very courageous and I think even audacious choice in a context where the usual entry level gift for the supreme leader is a Rolex watch you decided to bring an icon an icon of Jesus Christ as the prince of peace to give to the supreme leader now who would imagine that Kim Jong Un would accept such a gift and I remember working with you in our rooms in Pyongyang, preparing an explanation which we were asked to give as to what this gift was all about and why it should be accepted by the Supreme Leader. And I remember working through that delicate process with you. And I don't want to take time now to recall all the explanation that we developed together and that you led. Suffice it to say that the gift was accepted. And I remember, well, I've been subsequently struck by the fact that that was an opportunity for witness. That was an opportunity, one of the very few opportunities in that very constrained context to preach the gospel, which is what you did in that explanation. And I think it really demonstrated that quite unique combination of skills that you have. And I know that you'll be taking those skills back and using them in the service of your church in your new leadership role. But I know you will continue to be a gift to the ecumenical movement more broadly as a result of those special capacities. Finally, I just would be remiss in not saying also a special thanks and a greeting to you on behalf of the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs, which has, I think, really deeply felt and experienced your personal engagement and leadership in this important area of work of the ecumenical movement. Thank you very much, every blessing to you, and I look forward to and very much hope to continue this long working relationship with you into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Then we will turn to Boss Ecumenical Institute and Father Lawrence, the Dean of the Institute. They will love. I have this opportunity to express, to communicate the gratitude coming from the staff, the students, and the faculty of BOSE for your vision and for the support received during your tenure as the General Secretary of the World Council of Churches. It was clear that BOSE has a special place in your heart. Bosse as a hotel and a conference center, and Bosse as a place of ecumenical formation. That you resided at Bosse for a substantial part of your time at the World Council of Churches speaks for itself. We all felt the difference you made, especially when you moved into Bosse. Your warm and cordial way of interacting with the staff of Bosse, the reception, the kitchen, the housekeeping, caterers, the managers, is very evident. In an unassuming manner, you related well with everybody. The same is true of the faculty. With the students, we know how much you cherished the sessions where you met them. Something that touched me personally last year 
was when I learned that group of master students, we are calling you generous secretary. Instead of general secretary, they were calling you generous secretary. And people would wonder why. Discreetly, in a discreet manner, you showed kindness to these students. You shared your bicycles. You sent them food. During the Christmas period, you brought food, you brought wine, you shared whatever you had with them. We can only say thank you and pray God to guide you in your new task, in your new position. As one designated um, seconded by the Roman Catholic Church to the WCC, I would like to use my last minute to say a word in that regard. Dr. Agnes already mentioned, but I would say, I would add and say, during your tenure, the relationship with the Roman Catholic Church reached a significant peak. You and the leadership of the World Council of Churches met the visit of the Pope in 2018 a reality. Today, doors of collaborations and cooperations are open with many dicasteries of the Vatican. When Bishop Bryan calls to find out how I'm faring under this pandemic, he expressed his gratitude on behalf of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. They wish you well, and they are praying for you. Thank you. Thank you, Father Lawrence. Thank you. And I invite Jin Yang Kim, Program Executives for Korean Peninsula and the Pilgrimage, to enter the floor. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, good afternoon, Ulla. You may remember the caricature uh, taken by a Korean artist when you visited Korea last year. In the caricature, you look much younger, as if you got just you got a, such a uh, plastic surgery in Korea. <laughs> Every member of the delegation also got the same kind of caricature. It has been a, such a blessing for me to be working with you because it makes me feel so young. First of all, I would like to say thank you for your faithful commitment to peace on the Korean Peninsula. Like many other WCC programs for peace building in conflict countries, as Peter has already mentioned, the Korean Peninsula must be one of the most difficult, challenging ecumenical ministries. As Trump and Kim's relationships has been ups and downs, it's been a roller coaster ride of hopes and disappointments over the years. But your faithful commitment remains unshakable. Thank you. Secondly, during your term as General Secretary, you have shown us the crucial point in our work that the peace building is not a result, but a process. As you have done a tireless and ongoing work for peace building and reconciliation in Israel, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Colombia, Nigeria, South Sudan, the DRC, Burundi, Ukraine, and the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. And lastly, you have courageously invited us to the ecumenical calling of the pilgrimage of justice and peace. Thank you for leading us as the community of hope. Thank you. Once again, thank you for your ongoing efforts to strengthen the ecumenical bonds for peace and reconciliation. Many blessings for your new journey as presiding bishop of the Church of Norway. Hope you live longer, but stay younger. Thank you, dear love. Thank you, Jin. Thank you. Then I invite Penny L. Raikumar, Program Executive for Interreligious Dialogue, and you have also slides. Dear Ola, let me begin by acknowledging how grateful I am for this opportunity to say a few words today. 
I first met you during the launch of the Cairo's Palestine document in 2009 in Bethlehem, where you attended as the incoming general secretary of the WCC. In Bethlehem, you were introduced as someone who was strongly committed to interreligious dialogue and engagement. This is a commitment that you clearly brought with you to the WCC and sustained and nurtured over the years. Under your leadership, we have even expanded the ambit of our engagement beyond our existing engagement with the Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, and Jews to include Confucians and the Sikhs. We have even helped to set up the new network of interfaith officers and advisors last year. With your encouragement, we have also deepened our work in many areas, including in the area of theological and intellectual engagement, called usually as the dialogue of the head, most recently through the launching of current dialogue in a new format. We have also deepened our work in the area of practical engagement, what we call dialogue of the hands through our practical projects, including the Nigeria Monitoring Center, which you spearheaded. But today, I want to speak about your commitment to interreligious engagement and dialogue, not from the perspective of the dialogue of the head or of the hands, but from the perspective of the heart. First, you have a heart for young people. And this was very much apparent to me during a visit to China. The sheer joy with which you interacted with the students of the Shangzi Bible School as you encouraged them to be witnesses in a multi-religious world is something that is etched in my memory. As a mark of gratitude for your work, the participants of Yatra 2016 also sent you a t-shirt with messages for the pilgrimage of justice and peace. Second, you also have a heart for religious minorities. I particularly remember the sincere and courageous way in which you raised the question of the demolition of the Golden Lampstand Church during a meeting with the Minister of State Administration for Religious Affairs in China. On a lighter note, I also remember the time you decided to continue with your participation in the Roundtable on Religious Minorities in India in New Delhi during your visit there, despite having just had a surgical procedure for an infected thumb. I have always remembered that as a thumbs up moment for solidarity with India's Christians and Muslims. And thank you very much for that. To conclude, I just want to say that all this was possible only because of what can be termed in your own words as Christian solidarity in the cross of Christ. May this cross be your compass as you navigate the new ways that God has in store for you. Godspeed and God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Penya. Thank you. Then it's time to listen to a recording done by Carla Kion, program executive for Middle East, early this morning.
Yes, just just a word. I, I will send you the full recording, Olaf. So I, I'm I'm not very good in uh, words. When um, yeah, so I I sent you a guitar recording just to say that the Middle East is a very complex place to be in, but you've been very committed to it, um, and we all know that. Um, so although it's a complex place to be in, but it's a great place to um, keep in your heart. And I know that is something you will. And I'm looking forward to continue working with you um, in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it is uh, very overwhelming uh, what I've heard and uh, what you share. Uh, I recognize uh, many moments in our life together, many challenges, many blessings, but I would say also many moments where we really felt that uh, we were doing what we, what we were asked to do together. And there were some fruits, there were some results of the work we were able to do. So uh, please accept my sincere thanks to all of you. All of you have spoken, all of you who have not, but I also sense you support and you are behind what is said. Uh, if I may just uh, name one, I cannot name more than one, as a representative of all of you, uh, let me mention uh, Diana, whom I'm seeing every, every day I've come to work, and who has, uh, in my view, expressed both the, the commitment you all have, but I would also say uh, the joy of working together, and also for me has been the joy or working to you, with you all, and through Diana's presence in the office, it has been always a joy to come to office. But that has been the case with all of you. So let me, uh, through what um, Diana shared, also respond to you. Thank you for your your presence. Thank you for your the way of making this a very meaningful, but also a very joyful, ten years period. There are. Uh, some some issues I could like to 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 share, but uh, I will make it very short. I already shared some of what was really in my heart at this point in my in my sermon to you. But um, I remember I had to say uh, sometimes in the first weeks and months of my service that uh, I'm not the general secretary of the past. I'm the general secretary of today and of tomorrow. Well, uh, today I have to say the same. I'm not the general secretary of the past. But I say it from another perspective. I say it from the perspective of knowing what it is, but also knowing that no, nobody can be a general secretary alone. It is only together, together with the staff, together with the governing bodies, together with the churches, together with many partners outside the WCC. And you have mentioned them in many ways, and I could make also the list even longer. But this sense of, of working together really has been a privilege, a unique privilege I never could expect, but also many challenges, many challenges. And sometimes I've said, we do what is difficult because it is important. And I hope that this has also been what you have felt when you have had to deal with many of your challenges that you could feel my support and together we could find the solutions that could bring us forward. I really hope that there is another moment when we, not only in this way, but also in another way, can celebrate the work we have done together, the time we have had together, and celebrate that also life continues in different ways, but also with relationships that will not be broken, even if they are different. I thank you also for your support to my work, to my family, the joy we could have also to be there as a family, and I live there half of the time, but also when I had my children and grandchildren visiting. My father also had the privilege to, to be there at the first couple of years uh, with these uh, installment events and so forth. So for me, this has been a journey in my pilgrimage of life that has been very unique and it will remain as a, as a very significant, but I would also say as a blessing beyond I could imagine forever. 
And thank you also for the way you say you're looking to what will be the next and how can we together work from my new uh, position, my new task as, as a bishop in Norway and as a presiding bishop. I really look forward to the same. And um, now the consecration is scheduled for the 10th of May in Nidaros Cathedral, where many of you have been, as we had our central committee there in 2016. And even it will, it will be even a very small uh, group, only as much as uh, these circumstances allow. It will be also with a sense for me that you are there because you have been there and with the words you have shared with me today. So may God be with you. May God give you a lot of courage and strength and also the ability to work together and now the leadership of Father Jan, whom I have known all these 10 years as a good friend, as a good colleague, as a good leader. May God bless you, Father Jan, as you continue. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Marian. I'd like to say a few words on behalf of the leadership on the way forward. And as I share these words uh, from the leadership of the council, I'm reminded that the gift of leadership, the exercise of leadership and service takes place in good and difficult times. And therefore, our concern is to constantly keep in tune with one another and with God who calls us into these opportunities to serve in his vineyard. Uh, in the last meeting of the leadership group, we did reflect on a number of decisions, some of which I'll share with you now. And one was that, uh, the governing organs of the council in terms of meetings are postponed. That is, of course, the executive committee and the central committee. However, the executive committee is planned to take place digitally in May. The other decision was that we postpone the Central Committee to early 2021. And as you know, there are some major decisions that can only be taken by the Central Committee. The third proposal and decision by the LCC is that we continue with the plans for the 11th World Council of Churches General Assembly to be held in September next year in Germany, in Karlsruhe. Uh, as we continue to trust in God that the coronavirus will have ended and it will be well. We also have indicated that because of the fragile nature of the global context in which now we are exercising our gifts and our roles at different levels, it demands of us to be extremely sensitive to what is happening and its impact on the lives of our churches, our communities, and our nations. Recognizing that many of our people are experiencing fear and uncertainty including death, separation, isolation, loss of members, and much, much more challenges, including traumatic disorders. We therefore are calling on us to continue in prayer and that our prayers are necessitated by a heavy and strong burden, as James 5, 16 tells us. Our prayers are to God to restore the earth and his people. LCC also, having acknowledged and accepted that the Reverend Dr. Ola Fixetwet is moved on, 
appointed Father Johan Sauka as the acting general secretary, awaiting confirmation by the executive committee, which we are going to do through postal and electronic electro voting. May I, on behalf of LCC and on all of, on behalf of us all, express our gratitude to Father Sauka for accepting to serve the World Council of Churches in his capacity and heartily welcome him as he assumes the new assignment. As LCC, we commit to support and pray for you and the staff team. It is our hope and prayer that you will continue the team spirit even during the good and difficult days ahead. As you assume the mantle of leadership during these uncertain times in the history of humankind, may God grant you wisdom, knowledge, courage, and inner peace. May the words of the Almighty God spoken to Joshua be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Comfort you and encourage you. And once more, thank you and welcome to serve in another capacity the work of the World Council of Churches. As leadership of the World Council of Churches, we remain connected and continue praying for and with you as staff and as the leadership for the churches and communities around the world. That by God's grace and mercy, we will keep the candle of hope, solidarity, and accompaniment amidst social distancing, pain, and loss, that Almighty God will put a hedge of protection around everyone, and we will be sustained and kept healthy by the stripes of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father Sauka, welcome, and be assured of our prayers and support, both as the leadership and the staff. God bless us. Shalom, peace, Amani, Raliet. Thank you, Dr. Agnes. May God be with us and give us his strength and power. Dear Dr. Agnes, dear, Doc, dear Bishop Marianne, members of the leadership of the Central Committee, dear colleagues and dear Ulav, I find it difficult to give voice to the sending words and cannot but use apophatic terminology to share what we feel. A bitter joy, a freeing sorrow, a joyful sadness. We feel sad that after 10 years of working together, the time has come for you to leave the WCC and to return to your home country and your church. At the same time, we are rejoicing with you that the Church of Norway is getting back one of her children, solidly experienced in ecumenical and international work, and who is taking the venerable position of her presiding bishop. We are sure that you lead your church with new vision and enthusiasm, the same way you have led the council during the past 10 years. If I am to express uh, our gratitude to you, I would have to give a long sermon. So I will refrain myself only to four points, but to, I have to acknowledge that colleagues who spoke before me touched on some of this. One. I remember very well the enthusiasm with which you have shared and promoted the visionary post-Busan paradigm of ecumenism, the pilgrimage of justice and peace, and how this whole idea came to your thought after meditating in front of a stained glass window with many colors coexisting and interrelating with one another, the Église de Notre Dame de Toutes Grâces, on the Plateau d'Assis, 
in France. I also remember that you shared your reflection about that image with Pope Francis when we visited him after the Busan Assembly. We may not know clearly where the paradigm of pilgrimage originates, but almost the same time, WCC and other church leaders found themselves speaking the same language and using the synonymous wordings, pilgrimage, walking together, common journey. And this paradigm has become the guiding principle which penetrated the whole work of the WCC in this period. Second, I'm also aware <clears throat> that the theme of the next assembly has been for a long time a search and a longing of your heart for speaking and articulating the love of Christ in relation to his cross, which has to be at the center of the ecumenical movement. There are many debates on that and on the biblical text from 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 14, the starting point and the basis of the theme of the Karlsruhe Assembly. But this has been finally selected and approved by our governing bodies, and this is to shape the ecumenical movement in the next period post Kasui. Thank you very much for your visionary contribution. Third, your work in further developing BOSE as a conference center and credible academic institute of ecumenical formation. The Green Village project, which was initiated and started under your leadership and guidance, the securing of the pension fund for the future are great achievements. And four, your passion for and commitment to bringing solutions to and reconciliation in situation of conflicts and war has been outstanding and the profile of the WCC International Affairs has become visible and highly respected and appreciated during your time of service. Finally, I would like to express personally my thanks and gratitude for your trust in proposing my name to the leadership of the Central Committee to take temporarily the role of leading the Council until the next Central Committee, which will elect a new General Secretary. Now, some colleagues said that you are courageous. I would say, yes, you are courageous. You propose an Orthodox priest without being obliged to look at the quota. Um, and uh, balances, and still you proposed me, and I'm very grateful for that. And I'm grateful to the leadership of Central Committee, which affirmed and accepted your proposal. I'll do my best to serve as I did during all my years of service, but with much humility and determination. I'm not afraid of challenges and crises, because often those offer a chance for renewal, reshaping, and a new beginning while trying to listen to and follow God's will in concrete situations of our times. It happened that all responsibilities which were entrusted to me during my years of service at the WCC were given in times of crisis and challenges. So I'm not afraid. And out of that, I have learned that one cannot work alone, bringing solutions to or achieving, having achievements alone. To be successful is necessary to stay always in solidarity, to be aware of the need and to consciously search for the help of the others, to work together with the others. I'll do my best to fulfill this temporary role, but together with the colleagues, with the SLG, and under the leadership and guidance of the leadership of the Central Committee and the governing body. A new structure will be proposed and implemented later this month as the perspective for this period grows clear. Until then, work continues as until now, but with additional responsibility for me as acting general secretary. The programs which reported to me until now continue to report to me until further notice. Reporting to me from today are the SLG colleagues the managers of human resources and of IMD and PMER and the coordinators of the assembly office and of the conference office and uh, governing bodies. 
as well as the staff of the General Secretariat. I'm sure that together we will do our best to lead and move the ecumenical board towards the next assembly. And I'm grateful to you, Olaf, that you have accepted to be called anytime I need help for counseling or for guidance. I pray, finally, that God enlightens your path as you leave the WCC, gives you strength, power of service, and witness so that you continue to walk together with us as a pilgrim for justice and peace. Thank you.